welcome back to The Whole Person Revolution, a podcast of Comet Magazine. I'm your host, Ann Snyder, and we have started a series that is inquiring into a rather unwieldy question of social change, the subtleties of how change builds, the common ingredients at its inception, the precipitating role often of a sense of crisis, the mix of ideas people versus movement people, and a lot more. Today, our second episode, I want to talk about something that really lies as the precondition to all of this, and that something is attention. With me to help us do that is Mark Laberton, the President Emeritus of Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. I'm genuinely delighted to get to introduce him to you. Uh, just Mark's courage before the future, his ability to hold and attend both to the woundedness and the wonder of this life, his gentle fluency in crossing borders and expressing solidarity without show, and just his very Christ-like countenance have been no small encouragement to me. It was Mark's 2014 book titled Called the Crisis and Promise of Following Jesus Today that probably most powerfully informed the missional arc of Breaking Ground, that one-year publishing project and now enduring institutional coalition that Comet created in the wild year of 2020. And there just has always been something in Mark's commitment to the iconoclastic reality of God the game-changing reframe of our reality by his that just has kept me close personally to the further up and further in hike to kingdom living and kingdom logic. Mark, genuinely thank you for being who you are, for your friendship across the miles and the example of your leadership. Welcome to the Whole Person thank, Revolution. Thank you so much, <laughs> and Wonderful. Wonderful to be here and very, very grateful for your super kind words. So thank oh, you for that. That is sincerely said. When I was thinking about you, I was like, Mark always takes me down to like a submarine window that's like eight miles <laughs> deep. So we might as well just start in that submarine. Part of why I invited you on here was something very memorable to me that you said, I want to say it was six to 12 months into COVID. Um, and you were generously participating in a few gatherings that I was trying to facilitate for different kinds of Christian leaders and their institutions through the pandemic. And you said something to the effect of, this feels like a moment that's just replete with a moral opportunity, and there's a seminal invitation for the church, but somehow we're just not attending to this zeitgeist at the deepest level, and it's troubling. Like, why is Christian moral reasoning as troubled as it shows itself to be? If I'm recalling what you said correctly, I, I think you said it more eloquently, but what exactly do you think you meant by the seminal? Well, I think in any time when there's so much turbulence and so much uncertainty and so much that's shaking and rocking and rolling from different cultural angles, whether it was the pandemic itself or whether it was all the racial, so-called racial reckoning that was going on, or whether it was simply the ongoing suffering of people in circumstances through economic disparity or through um, various forms of human struggle and pain, the chaos of the church, the, the sense in many ways that the church was God's greatest scandal uh, rather than the gospel itself. And uh, all of those things were were flailing in different ways. And I, I think it, in that sort of a moment of disorientation and disequilibrium, I'm just struck by the fact that it creates an opportunity for something to be rediscovered as well as newly discovered. So the rediscovery part of the seminal piece that I was referring to, I think, is that sense of what is the taproot of the project called being a human being that is exposed and illuminated by this season of such turmoil and struggle, what's exposed about who we are meant to be and how we've been created and what it is that God's initiative in and through the life of the church is meant to offer to a world in, in exactly a moment like this. In what way in this moment is the church genuinely light and salt? All of those things come from a seedbed, hence seminal, of things that were God's uh, deepest intentions and purposes and, and hopes for uh, the people of God. And yet, and yet, and yet, what 
was endlessly talked about, felt as though it was symptoms. Now, symptoms are fine to talk about because they're the reality that we're living every day. And, and I'm not therefore saying let's ignore symptoms. I think symptoms are critically important. But the events and circumstances are not necessarily the things themselves that are the most important to be uh, ending the conversation with, but beginning the conversation with. Let's acknowledge the symptoms, but then let's go to the deepest places we can in asking what what is this? What's actually going on? What's being exposed about who we are and who we aren't, about what our relationships are like, either with God, with one another inside the body of Christ or with the wider culture? All of the, those dynamics all felt like they begged for seminal discussions, not just for circumstantial ones. Do you feel like that kind of lack you're noting or sort of the inability to get beneath to the taproot, as you say, was or is only a um, feature of the Christian community? Or is, it, is there something more sort of endemic to the pace of life? Is this just a feature of our time that afflicts all human beings struggling to stay afloat? I mean, <clears throat> let me just say first that paying attention is one way of defining what it means to be human. And one of the ways that, that from a Christian point of view, one of the deepest meanings of what it means to be human is to pay attention to God to the world in God's name, to ourselves uh, as creatures made in God's image. And that labor, I think beautifully captured, especially in Psalm 8, is a text that suggests this act of paying attention in all those dimensions is actually not instinctual always and not automatic and not easily accomplished. And I don't think it ever really has been. I think w whether our circumstances were formed in uh, the medieval period or in ancient days, there's always there's always endless distraction. And it may just be distraction at the most personal, interpersonal, localized, hyper-localized level or, or more broadly. So I think there's always been reasons and abilities to be distracted. Uh, even the garden itself uh, presents just a distraction from the beginning that overwhelms the attentiveness to the fullness of what God had given uh, Adam and Eve, right? So it's that it's that portrait of our easy inattention and uh, and the struggle. So I definitely think you're right that it's that it is a human uh, factor, and it's a human factor driven by finitude, the fear of finitude, by always uh, wanting to f face what we or or hope for, long for what we could imagine and that's a positive motivation but the the negative or more sometimes destructive motivation is is simply fear so that those two things whether it's self-protection on the one hand or whether it's simply distraction and um imagination on the other that's a spectrum of good and and bad reasons um but it's it's a uh, it's an array and i think that's part of the human experience you're right, of course, that we live in an area of hyper inattention. And part of the critique of our era and part of the critique of social media is the capacity to create inattention. And so many studies have been done about the fact that our attention spans are shrinking, that our ability to, to maintain sustained focus, whether it's in reading, as an example, or whether it's simply doing a job, or whether it's actually in a conversation or sustained conversation around whatever it is that might be the, the topic of that moment, is very hard for people to sustain. And we do life in tiny micro bits. And, uh, and as a result, it's no wonder that it's not nourishing. It's no wonder that it leaves us more frazzled, disenfranchised, uh, disconnected rather than connected, either with ourselves or with God or with uh, each other or the world. So... Yes, I mean, I, I do think it's a, a, a it's a human condition, but it's it's uh, particularized in our era in a way that is almost like an in, a set of inventions for inattention. I've been actually noticing at the beginning of this new year, probably mapping onto some broader trend in era and where we are post pandemic. And I'm hearing a lot of words like slow, slow work, um, attentiveness, um, savor, uh, full right. presence, anti multitasking, right. like all these right. things um, <laughs> right. that who knows if we'll actually be able to do. The broader forces feel like they're 
you know, we're, we, we don't have a very good handicap, yes, <laughs> but yes. um, it's interesting that there's this wave of a desire to reclaim agency. Well, I just, I'm, I'm struck myself. We, our family has just moved from Pasadena where I've been working at Fuller to our home that we maintained in the Bay Area. And in moving back to a place, there's, it's evocative of many different memories, some of which are joyful and easy and happy and some of which are challenging and dark and difficult and all the array of things that go along with place. But what I am aware of is that I, I am cultivating very deliberately an attempt to, to get many of the distractions further away from me. So even this week, for example, I didn't adopt this because of any conscious idea, but I found myself finally doing what uh, I should have been doing probably more disciplinedly along the way, which is simply unsubscribing to the endless numbers of things that are sent to my email. So it's easier not to unsubscribe. It's easier just to ignore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And I've done plenty of that. So now I'm more conscious in the last several days that I'm beginning the day by any email that seems to me to have just come to me by accretion. Uh, that I'm that's nothing to do with anything that has to do with me or any choice I've made that I want this to be on my radar. It's been foisted upon my radar and and I'm just choosing to clear it out. So I've probably unsubscribed to a hundred things in the last congratulations um, in, the, in the last three <laughs> days, right? And it feels oh like goodness. it's gonna keep coming because the machine will keep dumping this stuff into our lives, I realize. But uh I'm just taking that moment to try to get off of these lists, whether it succeeds, of course, is another matter. But it's an example of that same feeling, I think, that I have too, of wanting in this new season to create more space, less distraction. Yes, yes, yeah. whole whole yeah. full space. Yeah. I, you know, as I said in the at the outset, this question of attention um, is born out of an interest that uh, this podcast and then comment is asking for the next number of months around how social change has historically happened. Why does it sometimes feel like in more recent history, so-called like successful or effective social movements have wound up yielding more cultural fracture than unity and a sense of like hearts and minds truly being converted in a joyful direction. And, uh, you know, we're looking at that in a variety of ways and we're not being nostalgic. We're not trying to like go back to a time, but I'm just, I'm very interested in how does a wave start to form that is identifiable and has some coherence to it, but also dynamism and, and this issue, I think, of attending, as I think about, especially as I talk to young people and I hear the cynicism or even the despair, I would say, of a Gen Z or young millennials around uh, kind of where they find their role in a meaningful future, I hear sort of a, it all just feels chaotic and arbitrary, like history has no point everything's moving too quickly and there's no discernible like moral direction. So this has gotten me thinking about the conditions for real attention. When it comes to discerning like what's actually going on, discerning reality, especially in an age that has a bit of an epistemological crisis where we're all defining reality differently, where should we be taking our cues from um, I feel so often like we're drowning in narratives that are coming from politics or you could argue kind of the logic of empire or, and of course, just the steady hum of our own emotions and anxieties. What are the disciplines required to seek out that which is really real and then have the courage and sort of fortitude to act? Mm-hmm. Well, it's very tricky, isn't it? Because yeah. for, for all the reasons you've mentioned, um, it's it's one of our greatest cultural challenges. And I do think it cuts across generations. And while certainly uh, Gen Z and millennials are often the targeted generation for this, um, there's also a sense that they've been set up for what they're simply manifesting that's been created by other generations. And while that is an alleviate all sense of agency or anything like that, it does create a, an understandable context in which, uh, you know, as it were, living on coffee grounds is, uh, is not a sustainable way of either experiencing coffee 
or of sustaining a life. And and yet it feels like there's just a lot of coffee grounds laying around and uh, a sense of an unsatisfying, unsustainable, uh, un, uh, uh, unfulfilling context in which to do the things that you're describing. So, I mean, I, I think one of the images that I sometimes meditate on is, is an image like uh, the fact that it feels like so much of life right now is a cut flower existence, that it's um, that it's as though in some sort of way there's a historical radical discontinuity and and even severing in which, okay, the past was interesting and whatever the past was, but now for maybe just reasons of arrogance or blindness or inattention, it now seems as though that has impact, but it doesn't have relevance in the sense that I want to go back and understand the past in order to better understand how to live in the, in the, in the moment or in the future. Um, it feels cut flower like, like we just have to start over again. Like it all has to be made up again and everything is just being sui generis. We're just like making it up. We're cabbage patch dolls trying to uh, figure out how to live in a, in a world of all the complexity that you've described. So I, I do think part of it has to do with whether we can come to peace with the sense that our finite, limited humanity in communion with other people can actually decide to live in a different way. Just that fundamental decision. It's, it's a decision that on an individual level is like, can I settle in for a conversation? Not just have, have a chat, uh, send a few texts, but can what can I do to cultivate an actual depth of connection, which could last in a conversation, for example, of an hour or more? I think that's an art that isn't nearly as complicated as, for example, the largely abandoned act of writing handwritten notes. I'm not talking either about nostalgia. I'm just talking about the things that actually nourish us. Um, Michael Pollan, uh, the great food commentator and uh, so forth is a person whose advice about diet has always struck me, you know, eat food, <clears throat> mostly plants, not too much. Those three slogans are his pitch for how we should approach our diet. And the first phrase, eat food, is, <laughs> is obviously a statement that say, don't eat non-food. Right. <laughs> don't try to sustain your life on things that are, as it were, manufactured rather than things that are actually organic, lived food. Don't eat plastic. Don't eat made-up chemical combinations, but eat, uh, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Um, and I have often thought in, in terms of our own kind of moral, spiritual, social, emotional well-being, how are we choosing to, to eat food for starters? Are we willing to, to just eat food? So in one sense, I would say part of the answer to what you've asked is how are we choosing to eat food? That's, that's about settling in for the long conversation. That's about deciding that I'm not going to have, you know, a, a life driven by the number of followers or by the number of likes, but focused and given toward sustained depth and meaning rather than flashes of connection. And that's, I think, the difference between eating food versus uh, eating chemicals. And I, I think that the, that the nurturing of that has often been lost. And, you know, so many commentators have, have observed that one of the most powerful things parents can do is simply having a, a regular meal every evening together as a family. And whether you have children or whether you're just a couple or, or really if, if you're a single person living on your own, the opportunity to, to nurture life by an intention around f literal food that is actually about a deeper kind of food, about being human, about limiting your day, about settling into a, a moment of reflection, not just action or reaction. So I think if you let that extend to other parts of life, then, then it starts beginning to say, what choices am I making for food in my life throughout the whole of my life, uh, through all the, all the diet that I consume or engage? How much of it is, is plastic food? 
and how much of it is is actually nurturing food. That would make a big difference in the way that we experience so much about the world. Uh, I think that, for example, <clears throat> in the development of relationships with people who are not from our own racial, ethnic, or uh, economic backgrounds, this is where you, you don't you do not make any headway without settling in and eating food, right? You do not literally culturally come to know people without sharing food. But I'm meaning it also in the broader sense. You don't get there by by consuming one another as a snack and having bites of diversity, for example. That's that's just not what the exercise is. It's about long, sustained, deep, challenging, sometimes difficult relationships at depth. Now, not every relationship can sustain that or should sustain that. Not everything is the food that we should be eating. But where are we giving ourselves to a diet that enriches the repertoire of how we understand our life in the world, where we, where we both are fed and feed one another by our interpersonal attentiveness, um, or people that are in circumstances of great uh, need. I think this is where being a pastor is a gift in so many different ways. But one of the gifts of being a pastor for me has been the gift of trying to be simply present as deeply as I know how to the to people that I've been called to shepherd in, in, at times when I've been uh, in a pastoral role, or even in my role as a sort of pastor president to Fuller, um, that sense of commitment to, to presence absorbing and reveling and relishing the wonder of the person that I get to be with and to behold and to know and to love, right? Those are, those are places, those are sinews, those are muscles, those are <laughs> blood vessels, those are, uh, you know, nerves that are, that are cultivated over time and they sometimes grow slowly, but they, they are the stuff that actually makes life different than this sort of cut plant, uh, cut flower existence. Much to my surprise, you might make me a bumper sticker girl. I think I have to put on the back of my little Mazda hatchback, <laughs> eat food. Right. It's an amazing <laughs> statement. It really eat is. food. Okay. There's a cultural beginning for transformation. No kidding. What if I we just that, all ate food? Yeah, it should be in the New Testament. It's really good. <laughs> Do you see any person or institution or community that is choosing as best they can not to be a cut flower? Well, I do think that there are cultural groups that simply by their own communitarianism create a really different sense of rootedness, right? So I'm aware, for example, just this last week, I was in a context where um, some uh, Latino leaders were speaking. And one of the things that was profound about what was being said was this sense that even as multi-generational immigration now means for some families being in the second, third, or fourth uh, generation, at least, of being in, in the country, in the United States, and having done what many generations necessarily do, which is in ways to step away from their heritage, at the same time, especially within Latino cultures, and this was commented on at least by the number of Latinos that were at this event, the, though there is cultural difference and generational difference, there's a sense that you do not step away from your family. So, so the rootedness of a people, a community, a food, a, a belovedness, a, an honoring, um, that, that's, a, that's a remarkable thing. Or in, for example, African-American uh, churches that I've had close contact with, there's this incredible sense of multi-generational honor. Now, I'm very aware in both communities of the radical challenges that are existent within those communities about how this multi-generational change and development is going. But certainly as a, as a white American who grew up with a strong family rootedness and yet also a sense of deep American individualism in my in my whole being, there is a sense when I'm in those communities of realizing they are pulling on strings, sinews of connectedness that 
are really significant to me. And, and, and they evoke to me either the absence or the inattention that I've given to such connections in my own life. So I would point to communities like that as an example, uh, where, the, where the cultural reality may be rocked, I'll say, by different things that are happening. And at the same time, there, I'm aware that there is still so much depth and scope and reach in those communities that I'm, I'm moved and challenged by. Um, organizationally, I think of, of various, I'm here thinking specifically of Christian organizations, but there are many non-Christian organizations that would be good exemplars of this too. But I'll use one that I'm particularly familiar with, and that would be the International Justice Mission. So what's happening in IJM that, that does this? Well, really, when IJM understands and explains itself to itself and to its public, it sees itself as a Christian discipleship organization, which works out its discipleship through doing justice, and in particular, uh, trying to curtail violence against women and children uh, in, in the world, around the, around the globe. What sustains that very difficult, challenging, inherently challenging, problematic work is their spiritual sinews that they have developed through the spiritual habits and disciplines of, of their daily life as an organization. I don't know of another Christian organization apart from a, a religious order that has as strong a sense of rhythmic attention to God, to the people of God, to the purposes of God, to the scriptures, to one another, to, in our diversity, to one another, in all of our particularity, and in all of our commonness. Um, and, and I think that is going to sustain IGM on the, on the long work that they're doing because those things are connected. So I, and I would use Gary Haugen as an example, uh, therefore coming to your specific uh, question about an exemplar. I would say Gary holds that in his being. It's how he lives in the world. It's not a program that he instilled. It's really a, a, uh, a vocation that he sought to manifest in his own life, to nurture in the institution that he founded and leads. And, and of course, in every way, there's always exceptions and always problems. And there's always, yeah, buts, but, but. Yes, that's all true, of course. Um, but fundamentally, the, the arc of that commitment is is deep and profound. So, and I would I can certainly point to others, but I think those are some examples that I would begin with. So, in the last ten years, I've admired your leadership from afar, as I said, but you've also weathered a lot. What did you learn? Were some of your your own taproot or your fertilizer in the soil that allowed you to attend to the deeper currents of our times. And then that would then implicate how, you know, how Fuller specifically needed to respond in its institutional calling. A lot of this has to do with my early Christian experience. I uh, grew up in a very loving home. My dad, uh, I've jokingly said, saved certain neck veins for the discussion of religion because he really <laughs> wanted his two sons to do everything possible to avoid religion and religious <laughs> devotion. And his main critique, uh, which is still uh, a critique that has power in my own daily life, actually, is that what religious people do, what Christian people tend to do, is to take great things and make them small. And that critique, which is uh, can be superficially observed in daily newspaper headlines, or known deeply as somebody now decades into life in the church, that practice is is plainly evident. On the other hand, when I started reading the New Testament on my own as I was entering college, I was shocked first that Jesus and my dad had so much in common on that theme, that Jesus himself was very concerned about the way that religious and relig religion and religious people can often take great things and make them small. Uh, and then at the same time, he was offering the antidote to that, which was not the avoidance of religion, but what was uh, his invitation was to discover and to step into this thing that he was saying was now at hand, namely the kingdom of God, the reign of God over all of life. This was the thing that infinitely 
blew open the universe. It's what cracks open all things rather than shuts things down. It's the opposite of myopia. It's the it's to be invited into nothing less than the heart and mind of God for the sake of the world and the universe, right? That that sweeping sense of of uh, entree that Jesus comes to announce and to encourage. So when I became a Christian, it was really out of that invitation of wanting to live in this expansiveness that will change my sociology, that will change my understanding of the world, that will cause me to be um, a meaningful and purposeful doubter about reality uh, more than simply a, a, a claimed knower of, of elements of reality, et cetera. And that leads then to many other things. One of the things that le leads to for me is I get to be a permanent lean learner, uh, that, that any, anyone is invited to be a permanent learner. If life in the kingdom of God means anything, it's about being able to be unguardedly open toward all that there is to learn, to undo, to redo, to recreate, to remake, to reorder, all of these things, not under my authority or leadership or people like me's authority or leadership, but under the authority of the, of the one who reigns with love and justice and, and mercy and shalom. So that's just an expansive place, right? It's in my mind, it's part of what the psalmist means when he says that the Lord has brought us to a broad place. So. Fast forward, I eventually come to be the president of Fuller. It is, a, is a, in a season of what was anticipated and unexpectedly anticipated season of so many deep challenges, some historic, some having to do with, with issues of theology, of culture, of context, of, of race, of gender, of sexuality, of politics. And the list goes on and on. And all that's happening in the uh, what Dwayne Christensen at Harvard has called the first major disruption in education in 1500 years. All of that is happening all at the same time. So uh, you either, you know, as I was prone to at times in my own uh, private moments, especially to just be completely undone by all this, or to acknowledge, okay, this, this is the ultimate example in my own lived experience to, to date of trying to open myself to being a learner. I, I do not want and I don't need to claim the ground of the knower who understands all things, knows all things, and will now lead forth in doing all things. Instead, my posture, my own personal life, my own uh, professional life needs to be grounded in this sense of, of an openness toward God and an openness toward, uh, toward the people of God and the realities of the world that are all around us, whether it's everything from climate change to, to racial crises, gender issues, et cetera, et cetera, that are so much uh, in our faces. So that to me is, is the fundamental freedom, right? I'm going to assume a posture of freedom, not a posture of, of protectedness as though I have to either protect myself or protect Fuller. The protection that I think God offers is a protection uh, not of defensiveness, but a protection of reality, that, the, that God is the God of reality, uh, and that I want my vision, I want our community's vision as an institution, I want the Church of Jesus Christ in the world to be a body that exactly along the themes we've been discussing, pays attention to God, pays attention to the world in God's name. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's just a, a pilgrimage, right? So how do we, the freedom then of doing that means, well, then let's lean toward what is not me, lean toward what is not my way of thinking, my orientation, not my um, particular set of cultural, racial, gendered experiences. Let's, let's lean toward the God who holds all things and thankfully holds all things together um, to open up what might otherwise be unseen, unknown, un unexperienced. Let's do it through the lens of uh, what has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ uh, uniquely and in the uh, unique authority of the scriptures. Um, let's Let's let all of that come cascadingly toward us and let's actually pursue it 
rather than be passive um, and presumptive that what we hold and think we know is is the finish line rather than perhaps the starting blocks. So I think that posture um, is one that I have I try to maintain. Um, there certainly have been times in in this past decade when all of that has been massively challenged, when the potential of, of simply wanting to be um, protective or defensive or whatever uh, is has always been a temptation at hand. But it has, it has, by God's grace, I think, not been my fundamental instinct. My fundamental spiritual instinct is, is risk. Um, it's about, uh, it's about the risk of love. It's not about the risk of power or the risk of, of influence. It's the risk of love. So, all of those crises that you just referred to and more, in biblical terms are met by the love of God in which the people, the circumstances, the entities, the realities, the structures, um, all are met by a God of, of infinite love whose knowledge is as deep and attentive as it could be. Psalm 139 is at least one text that underscores that. There's no place that we can go in a circumstance, Romans 8, where we can escape the love of God. So if we bring the love of God or believe the love of God comes to us in these moments, then how do I discover the meaning of the love of God in these places of painful intersection, anguish, suffering, um, protracted circumstances that are, that are not my, uh, that are just not my lived reality perhaps, but which I share as a human being I want to share as a human being and as a disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, and I and I and we have the chance to share together as a communion of unlike people. So, if the church is not a as as Fuller painfully in the past, um, part of Fuller I included a a movement that was known as the Church Growth Movement, built on the the sociological observation that churches grow when they have the when people have the greatest sense of homogeneity. That sociological principle became almost a marketing mandate and an assumption built into a great deal of how church growth was sustained in the 80s and 90s. Tragically, it plays exactly into our uh, all of our inherent human and, uh, and cultural and racial biases that then sustains it in a, in a way that and almost adrenalizes it to a degree that has been, in many cases, tragic. And so much of, of the political division of today has to do with people who came to faith in context of homogeneity as a fundamental presumption of church growth. And then we wonder why they show themselves to be homo so homogeneous and so often unable to move beyond uh, that so cultural and, and racial location. So that's an ambling answer, but I hope it names some of the th ingredients that f to me are, are part of what I've at least tried to, to lead with and to live. That was so, that was very powerfully said. There's so many explanations for the longstanding small making that your father critiqued. And that's in some ways is a tale as old as that's not particular to our era. It does seem to be something, uh, I think it's human beings grasping something that is so much larger than we can put our right. hands around and out of right. a sense of overwhelm or right. fear or desire for familiarity or all the things we can sort of explain with sympathy and compassion. We do that, but we, but it's particularly perverse because it often, the small making also can have spiritual power in it. That is um, very, uh, that's when things get dangerous. Yes. Is there, is there any way you could provide sort of a concrete example of how that learning posture has sort of been sustained and actually transforms us in a way that creates greater sort of unity and um, kind of a greater capacity to love? Well, I think, that, I think the biggest form of that, honestly, is my experience as a pastor of a local church. Because what is a local church? In Calvin's language, it's a schoolhouse. 
Now, the question is, how do we set up the schoolhouse and who is the pastor? Is the pastor the principal? Well, that's an interesting, problematic, sometimes true part of the role of being a pastor. Is the pastor the primary professor, as it were, the person who, who claims the greatest knowledge base? That is part of the preaching task. It's part of the teaching and formation task. But it's also... Uh, and it, both of those two roles are also carried by the congregation themselves. So I am both uh, an authority to a community and under the authority of that community. And I am both a professor, teacher, pastor, preacher to that community. And I can't even begin to tell you how many sermons have been preached to me by members of the churches that I've led who ha that have profoundly changed me. They have been as much my teachers, genuine, deep, theological, spiritual, historical, cultural, racial, gender teachers than, than I uh, have given. That's, that's not a, a, a cliche. It's actually my, my experience of being formed by these communities that I've sought to serve. And, and sometimes I uh, and they, we are all pupils in the school. And we are um, of different ages and different experiences and different backgrounds and different levels of understanding and development and capacity and giftedness, but we are all there in a shared community. So the biggest set of experiments is simply the ordinary lived life of a congregation together, sustained presence over time in the midst of the glories and the suffering and the the agonies, the joys, the hilarities, the peculiarities, the eccentricities. I mean, I think I could go on and on about the fact that I, I love pastoral ministry, among other things, for all of the eccentricities that happen in a local congregation or, or all of the, the very distinct ways that people grow and develop. I, I think one part of that is the privilege of being with people in their passing because so many things get crystallized in a person's um, final days that have always been present, but it, it, unless they have a disease that really so incapacitates them, um, that most people actually walk toward death as themselves. We, can, we will die as we've actually lived. So death is a familiar experience because we live it the way we've lived any other experience that we've had. And in that comes this distillation and it's an experiment, right? It's, it is a constant schoolhouse. So the, the privilege of learning, 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 learning from people in their dying days, months, moments is, uh, has profoundly changed me. And I would call all of those experiments genuinely, like I go to the bedside um, on one level as as an experiment in thinking, now what will this death be like? What will, what will this family, this community, this experience, this suffering, I, not dispassionately, I'm not suggesting as, as though it is an object of my, uh, of my observations, but, but a, a context of learning again. So I, I'd point to something like that. Um, but I do think we can set our own school, our own curriculum. And I, I do think, uh, obviously, I've spent my life in and around educational context, so uh, it's, an, it's an easy metaphor for me, and it's not necessarily an easy metaphor for everyone else. But we can each find our best curriculum, and uh, whatever our best curriculum might be, whether it's, uh, whether it's the, our workplace, whether it's our neighborhood, whether it's our community, um, whether it's uh, individual people or systems or structures or institutions or movements, all of these uh, are contexts in which we can commit ourselves to, I sometimes use a, a year as a way of giving myself a year's curriculum. What is, my, what is my primary curriculum for this coming year going to be? Sitting here right now, I can say that I don't know that, but I don't know what it will be for 23. Um, but I can say that in the past, uh, I've taken parts of the world, which could be macro or very micro, and said, in this context for, the, for this year, I want to devote myself to being particularly attentive to these kinds of people, these sorts of circumstances, these moments, these periodicals, these 
uh, institutions as a way of creating a learning opportunity sustained long enough that I, I'm not just giving it a glance, but really uh, I'm stepping into it at significant enough depth that I could say something meaningful at the end of the year about what I feel like I've, I've actually learned. Now, if we do that with other people in a small group, for example, or in a, in a friendship, um, where, where let's just, you know, we're going to be together many times over the course of this year. What if we chose something that we were going to just check in with each other about in this year that we might agree together to be mutually attentive to, and then bring that to the conversation. Um, in other words, it comes down to something that can be quite personal, but can become actually quite public and social. So this pr question of social change, which is really behind a lot of what we've been talking about, has to do with how do I cultivate around me and within me um, a culture, uh, a, a way of being that tries to be intentional about, about learning, about growing, about presuming I have more to risk, more to love, more to discover, more to give, more to receive uh, than I would ever imagine. And it will continuously involve ongoing change. This is, of course, the thing that often stops us, right? Because there's, there's such a human instinct to want to avoid change. But, oh my gosh, the kingdom of God is a call to change. And everybody has to work out their resistances to change. And there's real and very understandable reasons why some people have particular anxieties around, around change. I, I, I've experienced many of those things myself, and I've experienced many of those things in the lives of people that I've known well. But if we can just take it in a measured way and expect and pursue change, not that undoes us, but that does press us uh, that that does look for the next and the unexpected and the discovery and the the oh my goshness the beholdingness of of someone who is utterly unlike us who we might by God's grace come to actually know at depth over time in a community or an individual or a system or a structure or, or an organization that we're committed to. Wow, I mean, those are just like um, oxygen to the human spirit and does contribute to a pretext for social change. It doesn't answer the systemic questions, um, but it does, I think, talk about what's in the seedbed, back to the seminal question at the beginning. Does that make sense? Very much so. Um... Yeah, the jewels of the jewels of the life I'd like to be in my whole life. <laughs> um, Mark, I can't thank you enough. This is um, such a gift to our listeners, such a gift to me. I think no one will be surprised now to understand why I so look up to you. <laughs> thank you for your nourishment and um, yeah, best wishes in your own transition to more change. <laughs> well, let me just say that I think what's going on in, in Comment uh, Magazine and, and in many of the other efforts that you're leading uh, is the cultivation of what I've just been trying to describe in my own particular way. It is oh, what, what you're doing and it's what you're stimulating in the lives of other people. And certainly for anyone who's listening to this, I would, I would just say keep moving into these spaces and uh, let the resources that are being created really land in your lives. I know this isn't meant to be a commercial and I'm not trying to advocate it in that way. I'm advocating it because it's an invitation to... Uh, to a rich life in a cut flower context. And that is worth giving yourself to. So thank you for your work in this very, very area that we're talking about. And if you look up to me, believe me, I do the same for you. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for listening to The Whole Person Revolution. Check out this podcast, Cultural and Theological Seedbed, at www.comet.org, where you'll find imagination for a thriving society animated by the Christian humanist tradition, including regular writing by Alan Jacobs and other literary luminaries, The Welcome Table, hosted by Greg Thompson, Zealots at the Gate, a feisty new podcast about religion and democracy featuring Shadi Hamid and Matthew Kamig, and a whole lot more. 
and consider getting involved in our growing comment community. You can write, you can read, you can host a comment supper in your neighborhood, or you can participate in a conversation with your fellow readers and an author. We want to equip you to be an agent of renewal in our time, and we need to learn from you. Write to us at podcasts at comment.org and expect a substantive exchange. We're honored to have you within our orbit and to pilgrim together toward wholeness in a world splintering against it. The Whole Person Revolution is hosted by Comet Magazine, edited by Becca Bruder, produced and with original music by Ali Crummy, audience strategy by Matt Crummy. I'm Ann Snyder, and I'll see you next week.